Thank you, Kim, and, and welcome everyone. And yeah, real thank you to Kim and, and Coastal Pharmacy and Wellness. They've got a really well-established uh, seminar series uh, pre-pandemic, and Kim and I met before the pandemic, and I was scheduled to come do a talk at, on location at the pharmacy in, in April, um, just a few weeks into the pandemic. So we, we had to reschedule, obviously, and then as we got closer to the fall, we realized in person still wasn't even close to happening. So I'm lucky to be the first um, presenter in their summer seminar series doing one using their new webinar platform. So we've practiced it. We think it's going to go smooth, but I, I ask just a little patience um, if we have any technical um, technical challenges. Um, so let me get right to it. As a brief introduction, I am a certified uh, exercise physiologist. I'm also a certified nutritionist and I'm a Mayo Clinic trained wellness coach. Uh, my goals for today, you know, Kim, Kim mentioned them a little bit, um, would be I'd really like to, I'd feel like I did a good job if you walked away with a small handful of fresh perspectives on how to approach weight loss, well-being, eating, exercise, and holistic self-care. So we're gonna do some uh, paradigm shifting um, along with some, some practical advice on uh, how to start moving in, in, this, in this more life-giving direction. Uh, one note is that I'm gonna mention um, maybe a dozen or so at some point uh, scientific studies that validate different approaches. I really, really like to use an evidence-based approach. I'm a stickler for providing references. Because of this online format, I don't have a handout for you. If you want the citation or the actual PDF of the journal, journal article for any study that I mentioned, um, I'm gonna have a follow-up email to you. You can email me back and say, that study that you talked about um, let me think of a good one. That study that you talked about, the, um, the rats and addiction and how that relates to food addiction, can I have the information on that study? Um, I'd be glad to share that with you. Uh, lastly, last piece of housekeeping is, I totally wanna hear your questions. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna answer them all at the end. So I'm gonna present for 45 to 60 minutes or so and then I'll answer all your questions at the end. That said, uh, using the webinar platform, there is a chat bar. So if at any point uh, while I'm speaking, you think of a good question, go ahead and put it in the chat bar. Um, we're gonna take them, all, take them all at the end though. Okay, so three quick facts, three quick statistics that sort of set the stage for this talk. The, Weight loss industry in 2019 was a $50 billion industry. Number two, diets have a 95% failure rate. Number three, 35% of people that go on one diet become addicted to the cycle of dieting. So to me, this tells us uh, a couple of things. On first glance, it says, change is hard or um, making changes to eating habits, exercise habits and self-care habits is hard. That's one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it is there's something um, fundamentally flawed with the approach because the $50 billion number means there's a lot of people trying, there's a lot of different products and, and approaches out there. The 95% number says, there's a high failure rate, and then the 35% become addicted, to me indicates some sort of a, like a vicious cycle loop. Like this thing isn't working for me, but it's the only thing available, I'm gonna try another one. Um, so what ends up happening is people end up thinking, it's not them that's, uh, it's not the diets that are wrong, it's not the approach that's wrong, there's something going on with them if they just tried harder, if they just had more willpower, if they just had more character, um, they, would, they would make this work for themselves. Um, what I'm gonna show next 
Uh, I'm going to share a study that describes uh, the real physiological flaw in diets, and then I'm going to share a study that, sh that gets into the real psychological flaw of diets. So rhetorical questions work better um, in person, but who remembers the television show The Biggest Loser? So I don't think it's on air anymore, but it was on for several years. And what happens is a dozen, 15 people um, show up at a ranch or a campus and they have a lot of weight to lose. Um, they're really eager to lose weight. Um, they usually have very emotional backstories of their challenges with weight. And then the show runs and essentially they're put on a rigid diet and they're put on a, a rigid workout program and they lose a whole ton of weight. Um, the cameras roll, uh, the, the credits roll uh, with dramatic music, everyone goes home and that's considered the end of the story. And people watching at home are inspired and they say something like, I'm gonna do that. So that would be cool if that was the, the whole story. But in 2013, a group of scientists and researchers did a study on the participants of one season of The Biggest Loser. And they did something that to that point uh, was almost unheard of in the, in the world of weight loss, nutrition, and exercise studies. And that is they did a clinical study that lasted for six years, actually six and a half years. So they uh, poked and prodded and me took measurements from and took questionnaires from uh, these subjects for the six months of the filming of the television show and the essentially that diet and workout program. And then they followed them for an additional six years. So we could really see the long-term effects of what happened. So the first important piece of data is, is body weight. So during the six month, we'll call it weight loss program and filming of the show, the participants went from an average of 325 pounds to an average of 200 pounds. They lost a really lot of weight in six months. In the subsequent six years, um, the average participant went from 200 pounds to 290 pounds. So they gained um, you know, somewhere between 80 and 90 percent of the weight back. So you know, already we're saying, all right, something isn't quite quite right here. Um, but still, the mainstream interpretation of that uh, is generally the weight loss program of The Biggest Loser worked, and then the participants failed to, to, to stick with it, failed to, failed to keep it going. Um, but the second piece of data reveals something different and reveals something physiological that's very, very, very important when you want to understand what contributes to that 95% failure rate of dieting and the, and the, the uh, way people get addicted to diets and the vicious cycles of, of yo-yo dieting and weight cycling, which is weight going up and down. So the researchers measured something called resting metabolic rate, which some of you might be familiar with. Um, I'm going to give a a lay summary. So essentially we burn a certain amount of energy every day. We, you know, in our culture, we refer to energy as calories. Um, and some of the energy we burn during the day comes from activity we do. But most of the energy we burn during the day, even for a very active exerciser, comes from what's called your resting metabolic rate. And your resting metabolic rate is the energy you burn just for living and breathing, just for existing. Um, and to, to put a perspective on it, say um, an average uh, person might have a total energy expenditure of 2,500 calories in a day. Uh, if they're exercising for an hour, 
750 of those calories might be from exercising and 1750 would be from their resting metabolic rate. So more of the energy we burn in a day, even for a big exerciser, comes from resting metabolic rate. What happened during the six month filming of the show is the subject's uh, resting metabolic rate adjusted for the passing of time and, and, the, and the natural aging process dropped by 499 calories a day. Um, now that alone wasn't a startling research finding because diet studies, weight loss studies had shown in the past that dieting, weight loss, and especially fast weight loss slows a person's resting metabolic rate. But the assumption to that point was that as soon as a person returned to quote unquote more normal eating patterns, and if they continued exercising, that their resting metabolic rate would return to their pre-dieting, pre-weight loss uh, level. And because these subjects were followed for six years, uh, we have data on what happened to their resting metabolic rates for the six years. And what we know is that their resting metabolic rates remained suppressed by 409, on average, 499 calories a day for the entire six years. If you look at a graph of their um, resting metabolic rate adjusted for the passing of time and the natural aging process, um, it, it dropped 499 calories during the course of the program and never returned to normal in six years. So really a way to look at this is that that kind of a program broke these people's metabolisms. Because effectively, if your resting metabolic rate is reduced by, let's call it 500 calories a day, that's the equivalent of eating a Big Mac every day before you get out of bed without eating a morsel of food. Or it's the equivalent of having to exercise something like an hour and a half to two hours for every 45 minutes to an hour that an age-matched, gender-matched peer has to exercise to burn the same amount of energy. So what we know physiologically is that these kind of approaches essentially put a person in metabolic debt. Think about it, um, the strain on your household budget or the strain on a business budget, if the first, whatever amount of money you wanna look at, let's say in a household budget, the first um, $2,000 you earn every month you don't even get to spend it. It goes right to, um, say, credit card debt. Um, that's what metabolic debt is like, is these people are, in the time after they went home from the show, they're eating well, they're exercising well, and their metabolisms are essentially working against them and effectively putting the weight back on, which is what we saw happen. So um, in summary, what we saw is the weight comes back on but for the first time, we have a physiological explanation, and that allows us to start to see something different happening besides um, a failing of moral character or a, a, a lapse of willpower um, and inability to stick with it. So, this, there's also a very significant psychological problem that makes dieting so prone to failure. And I'm going to explain this with um, a scientific study as well. So um, the researchers took a, a group of people. Um, they surveyed them as to whether they were dieting or not. So we have dieters and non-dieters. Um, and then uh, each subject came into the lab and was exposed to two different scenarios on two different days. Uh, they're not told. They're they're not told that this is a diet, weight loss, or or wellness study. Um, they're told that this is a general study, and what they're being asked to do is to watch uh, an educational video uh, and then answer some questions in a questionnaire about the educational video. 
but they did a little bit of a trick. So um, while the subjects were watching the educational videos, as a you know polite gesture, they gave them a plate of cookies and said, well, you're watching the video and while you're filling out the questionnaire, while you're, thank you for your time and volunteering to be in the study, go ahead and have a snack. Final important setup detail is the two um, videos. The first video, um, or one of the videos, the effective message was sweet treats are fun. Um, sugar, uh, sugary food is um, something we do with family. There's pictures of family eating cake together, celebrating birthdays, holidays. Um, it's a, you could think of it as a pro um, sugary snacks, pro sweets video. The second video that all of the subjects watched on a, on a different day, a different time when they came back to the lab was uh, more like a public health uh, video, public health warning kind of commercial, talking about all the dangers of eating sugar. Um, sugar causes cancer, sugar causes premature death, um, sugar causes misbehavior in children, um, those kinds of messages. So we really could look at the first message was kind of like um, sweet treats are fun, and the second message was um, sugar is the devil, right? And what the researchers did is measure uh, when you left, when the subjects left, they took their plate of cookies, they had pre-weighed the plate of cookies, they post-weighed the plate of cookies, so they had a scientific measurement of how much cookies um, each subject consumed. And there's really only one st statistically significant piece of information from this study. All of the subjects uh, ate about the same amount of cookies, except dieters when they were exposed to the sugar is the devil video, which is kind of surprising, right? Because with diet mentality, we think stern messages that tell you, you know, don't be bad, be good. Um, and a person who's a dieter is already made a pre-commitment to, you know, they're here to eat well and they're here to eat the right foods and avoid the wrong foods. But those very people, the dieters who watch the video with health warnings um, and weight gain warnings of eating sugar, um, those were the people that ate 39% more cookies than anyone else. And so this isn't an isolated study. It's one that I like to use because it's um, sort of like the previous one about the Biggest Loser study. It's a, it's a prominent study um, and it really summarizes this point really well. What we know is that what we know in the, all of the literature on the psychology of excluding and restricting food, so telling people you can't have certain foods or limiting how much food a person can have, um, results in both increased desire for food and junk food um, and the actual consumption of more food and junk food depending on what's being measured in the study. It's explained by two psychological uh, phenomenon. Uh, the first one is called uh, reactance and you've experienced reactance and you might be experienced reactance right now. I use this example a lot um, when I'm explaining reactance and where we are in our, our calendar um, makes it a heightened time because you've experienced reactance if someone tries to impose their political views on you. If someone is very coercive, uh, telling you that your views are wrong, your views are um, dysfunctional, your views are immoral, um, and theirs that they are committed to imposing on you are, are, are moral, are uh, effective, um, and, and essentially better than yours. You've probably felt this feeling of like, kind of really, um, your skin crawling, uh, you wanna make the person get out of your face. Um, and the last thing you wanna do is what they're 
attempting to impose impose on you. That's uh, the psychological state of reactance. And the psychological state of reactance is almost always followed by the psychological state of disinhibition. This inhibition is, um, we've all experienced it when we're trying to stick with something, whether it's an eating thing or studying or um, anything like that, and we go off the rails, so to speak. We're like, I'm just done with it. Um, I've had enough. Uh, I'm kind of rebel rebelling is, a, is an aspect of, of disinhibition. Um, so putting these together, um, diet mentality together is slowing a person's metabolism and making it physiologically harder for them to keep weight off. And then simultaneously, the element of diet mentality that is focused on exclusion, excluding foods and restricting food um, essentially puts a person in a form of psychological torture where they really think behaving one way is the right way to behave because it's what everyone is telling them to do and then maybe they've internalized and they're telling themselves to do but another part of them wants to rebel against it um, so you've experienced this before if you've gone on a diet and you uh, quote unquote stick with the diet for a period of time and then just feel like I need to eat X, uh, I need to have a cheeseburger, I need to have cake, um, whatever it is, um, because it's a part of you saying to the controlling part of you, um, I, I won't be controlled by you. Um, this, is a, this is a very big part of human nature that we want to make autonomous choices. Um, so, so that's a good summary of the psychological problem created by diets. So, so we're playing with something that uh, makes sense to all of us. And because you, you might be wondering, well, is this thing that my physician is proposing a diet? Is this book I read a diet? And, you know, in clever sort of trickery, um, a lot of people espousing diets, um, programs espousing diets, they'll say, um, this is not a diet. Um, this to me, my, my definition of a diet is a way to sort of test something, whether it's called a diet or it's called a cleanse or a detox or a fast or, or something else. Um, if it meets these criteria, it functions as a diet in the sense that it's going to cause that similar metabolic slowing and it's going to cause that same psychological strain. So I define a diet as a one size fits all, quick fix, dogmatic system of eating based on exclusion and restriction. That's the key thing to look for. Done to lose weight quickly and or gain a sense of control of your life. This is another thing to look for that fosters yo-yo dieting and weight cycling. So going on and off of diets and weight going up down and or a dysfunctional relationship with food and leaves you like your leaves you feeling like a failure and like you're constantly battling with food. So if we were in person, um, I would ask people, have you ever felt that way? And um, usually three quarters of the room or more uh, puts their hands up. So uh, you know, any of us who've been there, and I've been there, um, we know that feeling of um, it being excluding and restricting. We know that feeling of sort of the yo-yo dieting, like going on and off. Um, and we often also know that feeling of like, what's wrong with me? Why can't I stick with this? And that sort of failure self-talk um, that tends to come along with diets. I want to pause for a moment, for, for a moment and say that um, <laughs> if you're feeling like this is all bad news, um, don't worry, the tide is going to turn in five or ten minutes. I really, really um, think it's important to present that science about what's difficult about diets because they're so um, common and so ubiquitous and so um, touted as the only way. Um, I think it's really helpful to people to have some evidence that validates their experience of why 
that's been so difficult. But if you're feeling like <laughs> this talk is a real downer, um, it's going to shift uh, in, in pretty quickly here. But what I want to say next is that what usually comes with that diet mentality is an approach to exercise that's characterized by the very common saying, no pain, no gain. And this is so, 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 so common in the professional circles I run in with uh, other wellness professionals and our clients that we might be sharing and things like that. It's not uncommon for someone to say to me, I went to such and such exercise professional, he or she is totally kicking my butt. He or she is making me cry. He or she is, um, this is a terrible term, right? But you hear it. He or she is a real slave driver, right? So somehow um, we've formed an ethos of no pain, no gain. And if you look at the slide on the screen, um, this is a picture at a gym. You might not be able to see um, if, you, if you're able to hone in on the bucket um, that the gentleman's holding, it says Ben's puke bucket, right? And this is something that happens in, in, some, in some gyms. The idea is that it's sort of honorable or venerable to exercise so hard that you make yourself throw up. Now, I know this is a, this is a sarcastic statement, you don't have to be uh, a wellness genius to know that uh, throwing up is one way of our body saying something is really not going properly here. Something is really, I, I'm sick, right? Um, I'm unwell. Um, so that culture follows us. And what makes this uh, a problem is putting this together. You've got people that physiologically they're in a sense, starving and their metabolisms are slowing. Psychologically, they're in a battle with themselves. And then they're summoning the energy to go do exercise with this spirit of no pain, no gain. You know, it's, 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 uh, it needs to be miserable in order for it to be beneficial. Um, and I'll just say, you know, I'm not going to do a specific scientific study on that. There's a huge body that um, if you want to find a, what sustains people exercising, um, it's not willpower, it's not um, intensity, it's that they actually have an activity that, that they enjoy. We'll talk more about that in a moment. But that's um, sort of the collective problem both from both a nutrition and an exercise perspective. This puts you in uh, in a position that is is essentially a double bind. Um, you're an adult. You're a well-adjusted adult, and this approach is saying you have an you have two options. You can enjoy your life, or you can be you know reach your goals, be happy, healthy, and have good well-being. Any well-adjusted uh, adult will not choose between those two things. They will be doing something miserable and say, I need to stop because I need to enjoy my life. Um, or they'll be doing things that are solely enjoyable but are harming them and not creating well-being, not cultivating well-being, and they'll say, I need to make some adjustments to that and, and find an intersect between that which is enjoyable and that which cultivates well-being. Um, so this diet mentality puts a person, unfortunately, in that double bind. And what happens is they need to escape the double bind. So they go, quote unquote, on a diet. You know, they're, they're on it. They may or may not be getting some of the results they want to be getting. Let's say they are getting some of the results they're getting. But before too quickly, they're starting to be miserable. Uh, so they go off. Um, and then in the off position, because no one's presented a, a, a different um, perspective, they 
consider themselves a failure. So that's what I call the on-off failure cycle. Person feels like a failure for a long enough period of time. The only option society is presenting is go on a diet. So they go on a diet like the last one by a different name and the, and the cycle continues. Um, this is a, a quick anecdote that summarizes how embedded that thinking is. Um, five, six, seven years ago, a prospect came to me uh, to, to potentially work with me. And in our initial conversation, she said to me, I know what to do. I've lost 50 pounds five times. And no one had ever said it that poignantly to me. And I had to analyze this quickly. And, and, and I said you know, to myself, in a sense, she's right because I haven't lost 50 pounds five times. So in that sense, she knows how to lose weight more than I do. Um, but the hole in her logic was her system of losing weight also caused her to gain 50 pounds five times. Um, the analogy I like to use for this is if, um, those of you local here, if somebody rebuilt the bridge from Portland to South Portland, and this was a big project that took millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars, um, you know, all kinds of fancy engineers come in, it takes a year to complete the project, and cars successfully drive over this bridge for three, four, five, six months, but then in month seven or eight, the bridge collapse, collapses, and people are harmed, we don't consider that bridge a success and we don't consider the that approach to bridge building a success and unfortunately um, with diet mentality um, people get stuck thinking that um, when they lost weight it worked and when uh, they gained the weight back they failed but as you could see from from what we just what I described earlier, um, essentially the system of weight loss was fundamentally flawed. Um, so a good way of looking at um, this is not that people fail diets; diets fail diets fail people. Um, and I'll take this back to the uh, first statistic I gave you. It's a fifty billion dollar weight loss industry, and the industry uh, to be cynical um, but, I, but i also feel realistic profits on yo-yo dieting um, if you're a business person you know that the best customer is a repeat customer it's easier to get a customer back than it is to, uh, it's easier to keep a customer than it is to get a new customer um, so you know how much of that is you know um, intentional and how much of it is just looking the other way at at what is clearly a flawed system. Um, any way you look at it, it's a dysfunctional system that keeps those profits going and doesn't doesn't really serve people. So this is where we'll start to turn the tide. Um, and a good way to start to turn the tide is just to go over this definition um, that I call an the definition of an anti-diet. This is the antidote to all of that struggle. Um, not this definition alone, but what I'm going to present in the next 20 or 30 minutes. So an anti-diet is a personal and natural system of eating based on enjoyment and nourishment done as self-care that fosters sustained well-being as well as sustained weight loss if you have weight to lose and leaves you feeling in harmony with yourself. So, you know, with the phrase, if you have weight to lose, you know, that's an important distinction right there is that it's not... Um, when we're using this anti-dieting approach, it's not solely to lose weight. It's really about promoting well-being and coming along with well-being. If you have weight to lose, you'll lose weight. Um, and just to drive this point home, instead of being based on exclusion and restriction, it's based on enjoyment. So enjoyment is back in the game and it's based on nourishment. And what do I mean by nourishment? I mean, um, kind of the spirit that 
any parent or grandparent or aunt and uncle uh, feeds their kids with, right? So we don't um, tend to think of feeding children from the perspective of how can we make sure they don't gain weight? How can we help them lose weight? We think about their bodies are growing. Um, they need uh, food to grow big and strong. We think about we need to send them off to school with fuel in their body and brain um, so that they can think well and perform well on you know, school projects and tests. And I'll offer that adults are no different. Now, we you know the one difference is we're not growing, um, but we're still dynamic um, entities. Uh, we replace our cells, tissues, and organs on a regular basis. And our cells, tissue, and organs are replaced from nutrients in the food we eat. And um, we definitely need a, a continual supply of energy from the food we eat. And the quality of that food sort of determines both how well your body is um, regenerating tissue and how well you are energized. So um, that's a different framework. Um, it's, it's a framework of I eat um, for my well-being. It's not something that I uh, have sort of an adversarial relationship with. So I'm, I'm hoping you know, if we were in person, I would ask for a show of hands, you know, or ask someone to, to, to speak up. How does that resonate with you? I'm hoping that that um, I'm hoping, honestly, that it, that just feels kind of nice. Um, this idea that, wait, there's a different approach. It, it certainly sounds a little bit more, a lot more um, humane or humanistic. And uh, I'd like to hear more about that. So let's talk a little bit more about that. Um, is, you know, what I can't do in a, in a talk for a group of people is exactly lay out um, a detailed approach to how and what you should eat, because if I were to do so, um, I would be giving you a diet, right? And so what I'm gonna lay out is really a framework um, for this, I, this concept of, of anti-dieting. Um, I'm glad to take questions at the end, as I've said. I'm also glad if you'd rather um, ask me personally to take questions um, when I follow up with you by email. So a couple of, couple of frameworks. The first one, and if anyone's looking to make some changes, you know, as you walk away today, this would be a, a great general recommendation, is before you do anything else, get really good at drinking water. Um, this does physiologically, if we're well hydrated, every uh, process in our body works better. Um, so from a physiological perspective, drinking enough water is the absolute um, sort of nutrition fundamental. Also, um, from a behavior change and habit formation perspective, drinking water is relatively um, easier or relatively more doable than many of the habits uh, we try to create. And therefore, you have a great chance of succeeding and succeeding early on. And what I can tell you in, in my work as a wellness coach and guiding people and making really significant uh, changes and improvements to their habits is that that sense of um, confidence in, uh, in a task specific way, um, what we sometimes call self efficacy, is one of the most motivating. Uh, things there is. Essentially, this is catching yourself succeeding. Um, and success always begets success. So um, if you've got big plans, you're ready to really make some big changes. Um, I say keep that mojo, keep that enthusiasm, but make a small change. Um, see yourself over the next week or two weeks, really master um, making sure you're drinking enough water. And I'll give you a guideline there. Um, take your body weight in pounds, divide it in half. That number in ounces is a good amount of water to drink in a day. So um, to use simple math, uh, 140 pound person, cut it in half, uh, 70 ounces of water a day. And then I'll give you another sort of trick or tip on how to make that even more doable 
and 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 help yourself get some initial momentum with succeeding in in forming a new habit. Um, drink 10 ounces of water right when you wake up in the morning. So make it part of your first 15 minutes routine. And then you have that feeling each morning of checking something off, either literally or mentally, that you intended to do, that you committed to do, and you're succeeding. Um, so with that 70 ounce example, you've now got, uh, you know, you have 10 ounces out of the way, you've got 60 ounces left. And then to make this real simple, take that number for the rest of the day and divide that in half and make it your, uh, make it your goal to have half of it before lunch and the second half before dinner. Um, that again breaks, it's not as, it's not as daunting. You don't have this um, two liter, 60 ounce water bottle looking at you thinking, how am I gonna drink that the whole day? Um, you're just gonna have half before lunch, half before dinner. So that's a good foundation. The next step is to start to have a framework um, around food that brings the enjoyment back in. And so um, we talked about in, in exercise, there's a common saying, no pain, no gain. This saying isn't as common, uh, but I think you'll get it. It's the saying that's usually associated with dieting and associated with that exclusion restriction approach. Um, this, the saying is something like, if it tastes good, it's bad for you. If it tastes bad, it's good for you. Um, and I would suggest replacing that with the saying, it tastes good and it's good for you. And then going about this exploration. Um, this is something I often do with clients and anyone wants uh, these lists I'm gonna refer to, I can share you with, share them with you. Is think of the, the, the large classes of real food and by real food, I mean unprocessed food. So um, that's vegetables, meat, fruits, nuts, and seeds. Um, for people who tolerate them, it's also, it can also include, include grains, uh, legumes, milk, and milk products. Um, but you know, things, things that are, you know, without getting too in the weeds, foods that are unprocessed. So let's take um, fruit as an example. Um, I'll share with a client a list of, you know, every fruit that I'm aware of. So it's dozens and dozens of fruit. And I'll ask them, check off uh, the fruits on here that you enjoy. Um, or another way to do it is rate, um, if any of these fruits you would give a, on a scale of zero to 10, where 10 is you know, the most you know, really delicious and zero is not your thing, um, pick some of these that you'd get, pick five that you'd give a 10, five that you'd give a nine, five that you'd give an eight. And I haven't met a person, even someone who's really got that entrenched idea that, oh, it's time for me to lose weight, it's time for me to improve my well-being, that means I need to go on a diet, that means I need to give up foods that I like and I need to, to eat, you know, rabbit food, I need to eat foods that's miserable. Even a person really entrenched in that, when we go through fruit, we go through vegetables, we go through um, meat, if they're, if, they're, if, they're, if, if they're a meat eater and they choose to eat meat, um, even that really uh, person stubbornly entrenched that I don't like healthy food will pick several fruits, several vegetables, and that person will be saying to me, I love Brussels sprouts, I love cantaloupe, I love grilled salmon. And we now have a shift. We've now um, started to dissolve that idea, that, that diet mentality ethos, that if it tastes good, it's bad for me. If it tastes um, good, it's bad for me. Um, so what I would suggest is to do that kind of exploration. And like I said, I'll share lists if you wanna use some of these lists and really start to look at what real food you genuinely find um, nourishing. And the next step, this, this takes, um, takes some work, um, but is really, really life-changing, is to start to get back in touch with your natural hunger and your natural fullness, because um, with diet mentality, you learn this whole good food, bad food thing, um, and the whole like, you know, eating well can't be enjoyable and pleasurable. 
but you also learn that your hunger is wrong. That when you're hungry and you're on a diet, your job is to stay hungry. Your job is to deal with it, cope with it, suck it up kind of thing. Um, and so a lot of people who've struggled with dieting for an extended period of time um, have almost lost sense of um, when they're appropriately hungry and or when they're appropriately full. And when I, when I bring this up, um, a lot of people will say, yeah, well, I also had the whole clean plate club thing growing up. So even when I was full, I had to finish my plate. Um, so um, this can get distorted in either or both directions. People can get good at um, forcing themselves to stay hungry, and they can also get good at uh, forcing themselves to eat past fullness. So what I'll offer, uh, and I'll share this visually in my follow-up email to you, is to think of hunger and fullness on a scale of zero to 10, where zero is absolutely famished. Um, you're really, really, really uncomfortably hungry. Um, and 10 is really, really, really stuffed. Um, Thanksgiving situation, um, something like that and, and to the point where and I, I i think most of us have been there where it's actually uncomfortable you know it actually hurts a little bit um so we'll call that like famished and stuffed and what you want to first start to do um there's, there's lots of ways to play with this but one really neat self-awareness activity is to set a um set a timer three or four times a day something like when you wake up mid-morning mid-afternoon um evening and before you go to bed there's lots of different ways you could customize it and check in with yourself and say on that scale of zero to ten where am i on a hunger fullness level and do that for a week or two and and um log it if you want to write it down if you want to um and essentially you're going to start getting in tune with your natural levels of hunger and fullness you know a lot like returning to um a childlike ability to um, really know when they're hungry, really know when they're full, um, and, and honor that. So then we put this together. So you've got a base of you're well hydrated, which I should add is important because if we're chronically dehydrated, we can confuse hunger for thirst. So um, we can really need water, but think we're hungry. Um, if you're well hydrated, you know, you've eliminated that problem. Um, if you're starting to eat when you're hungry and stop when you're full and you're eating real food, uh, eating mostly real food, so let's think of that, say a spectrum, take a picture of all the food you eat in a day or a week. Um, if right now 50% of the food you eat is processed food and 50% of the food you eat is, is whole, real natural food, um, a really great way to look at anti-dieting is that all you need to do, not more complicated than choosing from foods that you enjoy, that leave you feeling good and satisfied, that are real foods, move that toggle switch up so that 50% uh, real food becomes 60% real food, becomes 70% real food, becomes 80% real food eventually, um, without that idea of perfection, without that idea that I ever need to get to 100. Um, because if, if you go from, 25%, 35% to 65, 75% real food, every physiological function improves, um, every psychological function improves, and you know it's gonna at least move you in the direction of losing weight. Um, wanna add one thing. So what often comes up at this point is like, years ago, that's kind of how I presented to people, hey, this is a good way to eat. Tune into your own hunger, eat real food, and um, you know, that's, that's kind of the natural way of eating. And the common um, resistance that people would bring up is, if, you, if there's not a limit on how much I can eat, even if I'm eating broccoli and salmon and kale and bananas, I know myself, I'm gonna overeat. Now, I push back on that because um, that's simply been their experience to that point in their life. And I want to explain two reasons why that doesn't tend to happen to people. 
A, that reactance and disinhibition we talked about earlier is off the table. So no one is telling you, you can't have this, you can't have this, you can't have this. You have to limit your consumption to this, this amount. So um, I often think of this, uh, sometimes use the analogy of like a teenager. If you tell a teenager, um, you're in so much massive trouble if you're out after 10 p.m., um, they feel that um, they're being coerced, controlled. Uh, they feel that reactance. They have that disinhibition, disinhibition. They rebel. They stay out till midnight. Um, whereas with a more, hey, let's work together. What do you think is a responsible plan for, for coming home? You work on it together. They say, you know, maybe it's fair. I come back at 10, you know, how about I'm home at 1030? Because they weren't coerced, they don't have that disinhibition. Um, they don't have that reactance they don't have that need to rebel. So the same thing happens with eating and food. If we're not being restricted, uh, we don't tend to uh, go off the rails, rebel, um, which in, in, in eating can sometimes be, be binging, in, in, in binging, cheating, you know, however you want to look at it. Um, so that's off the table. And then this is super interesting. This is more from a physiological perspective. So the diet mentality says that if you, if you have enough energy, you should be full. Um, but we know that isn't true, and I'll prove it with a simple example. So if you go to Olive Garden and you get a bowl of, they serve a bowl of white dinner rolls, and you're hungry, and the instructions are, have as much of these as you like, most people would say, yeah, I can just kind of keep eating those things. Like I can eat white dinner roll after white dinner roll. I don't feel full. They taste good. I'm going to keep eating them. Um, but pretend instead that someone brought out, you can really use any plate of real food. Um, let's say broiled um, Brussels sprouts, broiled salmon, um, a platter of um, raw apples, apples that you really like, and said, have as many of these as you want. And you're hungry. Most people would have an apple, a second apple, and then something says, I don't want another apple, right? So with dinner rolls, potato chips, remember the Pringles saying you can't have just one? Um, their marketing is saying that they taste so darn good that you can't just have one. But here's what's going on physiologically. When you eat chips, Pringles, white dinner rolls, your body takes in energy, calories, but gets very little um, of what we call micronutrients, vitamins, minerals, and other micronutrients. So your body essentially has this experience of, thank you for the energy. I really appreciate the energy that you've provided me with, um, but I also, to survive and thrive, need vitamin C, I need zinc, I need magnesium, et cetera, et cetera. And the only way your body knows how to tell you that is to remain hungry. Um, our, our bodies, our brains are not um, subtle enough to be able to tell us um, we've had enough energy, calories, but we're missing certain nutrients, so you need to eat some other food in order to get those nutrients. It just stays hungry. Whereas when you have salmon or you have Brussels sprouts or you have apples, your body says, thank you for the energy and thank you for the micronutrients. I'm full now. I'm either globally full or I've had enough of those foods, right? So if you had the apples, you might say, I've had enough apples, but now I need, I need some vegetables or I need some meat. Um, and uh, so I call this nutrient-based satiety. So when you start getting, uh, or micronutrient-based satiety, when you start getting micronutrients in your body, which you have low levels of if you're on a more processed food way of eating, um, when you start to get micronutrients in your body on a physiological level, you start to feel more full. Um, so the game of being able to stop when you're full isn't just a game of willpower. It's not, it's not a game of controlling yourself. Um, you physiologically become 
more satisfied. Uh, my last thought on this, um, and then um, I'll really open this up to questions. If anyone wants to talk also, you know, after today, um, this is really the heart and soul of my wellness coaching is really guiding a person in this process, which is extremely individualized. People have different upbringings. People have different um, genetic makeups. Um, people have different outside factors in their life that affect their relationship with food. Um, but really what I'm doing and suggesting as a framework here is guiding you back toward um, what I call attuned eating. It means eating um, in a way that's attuned to yourself. Um, and what this really about is about is trusting oneself. So you're trusting your natural hunger and fullness, and you're also starting to explore what foods genuinely leave me feeling my best. And the answer is coming from you. It's not coming from an outside source. Um, so that's a framework for anti-dieting. I think the, the way more positive way of, of, of terming it is attuned eating. Um, I like to introduce it as anti-dieting when we're coming out of contrasting it with, with dieting. So, you know, just like we did with how dieting bleeds into no pain, no gain exercise, um, what I'll offer is you can take this anti-dieting mentality. Actually, let's look at that slide a little bit for a second, because that um, that's what I want you to think about with anti-dieting. So here's a person um, with a plate of food that's both aesthetically pleasing, um, nourishing, and you know, I'm venturing to guess delicious. Um, that's really the, the feeling I'd love to have take away. That's what's possible with anti-dieting is recoupling um, that which is nourishing with that which is enjoyable. And you know, looking at the smile on this woman's face, that's really the spirit we want to bring to exercise as well. So um, again, I like um, I like to uh, I like to use the common sayings, and I like to contrast them. And this is something I'll share with you in my follow up. Um, I have this when I do this talk in person. I have it as a something you can cut out and put on your fridge. So you know, the old way is. Um, if it tastes bad, it's good for you. If it tastes good, it's bad for you. The new way is it tastes good and it's good for you. With exercise, the old way is no pain, all gain, no pain, no gain. And the new way that I'm proposing looking at this is no pain, all gain, meaning you get to do exercise that's fun, um, that's enjoyable, that is in amounts that uh, fit into your life, that's convenient. Um, and that's where you get the benefit. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this is critical from a behavior change and habit formation perspective because I'm an exercise physiologist. If I was on a panel and someone came to me and said, what's the best exercise? I could split hairs and break down scientific studies and show that certain forms of exercise um, might have uh, a small percentage more benefit generally or say in a specific domain like in weight loss, in preventing cardiovascular disease, in preventing diabetes, in reversing cardiovascular disease or diabetes, in re uh, preventing dementia. You can split hairs, um, but my answer to that question because I'm not just an exercise physiologist, I'm also a wellness coach and I don't live in a lab, I work with real people and I need to help people make this happen, my answer would be that the best form of exercise is the exercise that you'll do consistently. And the exercise that you'll do consistently is the exercise that you enjoy. Um, so if you could show me on paper that a person would get um, better, the results they're trying to get, let's use a specific example, by running and say say they get 10% better results by running instead of swimming. But I got to know that person and they've never enjoyed running. Um, they live somewhere that's it's a cold, icy climate. So they could run comfortably outdoors three, four, five months of the year at best. Um, and maybe they have like achy knees at, at that point in their life.
and they tell me that they grew up swimming, they're like a fish in water, um, and their best friend would loves to swim and, and has been asking them to join them. Every day of the week and twice on Sunday, that swimming is a better choice of activity for that person, even if you could show they get some small percentage better well, well-being benefits from running because they're not going to continue running. So in a, in a year, say three times a week, 50 weeks a year, um, if a person swims 150 times and they run 50 times, even if you could show me that running was more beneficial to them, swimming because they do it, they're going to do it more, they're going to do it consistently, um, is going to be of more benefit. Um, so um, practical way to work through this for yourself, start with what kind of movement do I enjoy? Um, sounds simple, but you might struggle with, you know, I, I, I'm pretty sure I need to do something that stinks. I would encourage you to e explore the idea that you can actually do some movement that you enjoy and you, and you can get the benefits you want. Um, then what you want to do is, um, there's a, I don't even remember the movie this is from, but there's an old movie where um, the guy says, turn it up to 11. So on a, on a sound system from zero to 10. And so you want to turn the enjoyment up to 11. So that means asking yourself questions like, is th this given activity, um, let's use the, the swimming example, is it more enjoyable if I do it with a friend? Um, is it more enjoyable if I do it early in the morning uh, before work, or do I get more enjoyment out of it? It's more stress relieving to do it after work. Um, do I enjoy um, the YMCA situation where there's lots of, there's a, you know, there's a mixed crowd, there's kids in the pool, or do I enjoy um, the health club where it's only adults swimming? Whatever works for you um, that makes it as enjoyable as possible, that's like um, taking what could be an uphill climb of, of, of creating a habit and turning it more into a downhill climb. Same thing with convenience. Um, if you know yourself and you know that in your daily, weekly schedule, getting to a gym, the time of it, the effort of it is inconvenient, then then you might be better off investing in a little bit of equipment so that you can work out at home. Um, all of those kind of things are, are the things to look at. I'll add quickly, um, don't discount things that you don't consider, quote unquote, you might not consider real exercise. Um, walking to work, um, riding a bicycle to work, um, gardening, um, social dance, um, sparing you a specific study. There's tons of evidence that show um, both with weight loss, weight maintenance, and well-being, the greater amount of, um, this is often called something like non-exercise activity thermogenesis. I think that's the fancy term they like to use for it. That means the energy we expend um, from moving around, doing things that wouldn't look workouty, like you don't put workout clothes on for them, you don't do them at a gym or a pool or a track. Um, they're directly related to, to well-being, um, better body composition, uh, all of those kind of things. And then more of a um, observational study on those kind of things are Scandinavian countries that have really um, well-designed infrastructure, especially in the bigger cities, that promote walking and bicycling to work, to church, school, all these kind of things. Um, and it's associated with, with, um, with well-being benefits significantly. Um, and another fun thought on that is you might be familiar with um, this concept that's called the blue zones. The blue zones are five or six places on earth where there's this um, really, really high percentage of people who live to 100 or beyond and have much, much lower incidence of what we could call the Western ailments or the lifestyle ailments like um, 
cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, cancer, dementia. Um, and one of them is Okinawa, Japan. And fascinating thing about Okinawan culture, they don't even have a word for exercise. You can't find a word in their language for exercise um, that translates to our word exercise. Now they do have a tradition of going for walks together in the afternoon, but their word is more it would is 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 translates more to something like um, community get together outside. Um, so to me, this points to the fact that they're not doing it for burning calories, getting their heart rate up, getting a sweat. Those concepts don't really exist. Um, yet they're they're moving plenty to get um, the benefits of, of movement. All right, so that's, um, you know, putting this together. Um, we have the attuned eating approach. We have this, um, you know, just really allow yourself to move approach for the, for the sake of movement. Um, I want to tie this together with my final um, saying, uh, you know, paradigm shift. So something that comes with diet mentality, you may have heard this term, this, you know, uh, saying, you might use it. Um, people think it's time to get healthy. I know what I need to do. I need to eat less and move more. And I'll tell you, when I hear people say that, when people say that to me, um, to varying degrees, I hear some parent uh, some statements in parentheses after each part of that statement. I hear people saying something like, I need to eat less because I'm a gluttonous pig and I need to move more because I'm a lazy slob. So that to me is sort of the consensus spirit um, that comes with that whole diet mentality. And I wanna propose a different saying. And um, I call it nourishing food, nourishing movement, nourishing life. And what's helpful about this is that the spirit is different, right? This first came to me many, many years ago when I was hiking in the White Mountains and I said to an acquaintance, isn't it really nourishing to be out here in the woods? And she said, oh my God, I love use, the use of the word nourishing to mean something more than food. Like, that's true. Like, we can get nourished by nature or activity or uh, connection, all these kind of things. And it occurred to me that that's the spirit um, that I was learning at the time and that I was bringing to my clients at the time, and instead of doing stuff to ourselves, sort of imposing um, rules and guidelines and demands on ourselves, we're doing stuff for ourselves. So contrast, um, eat less, move more, and you can add those you know, not so nice phrases if you want, eat less, you gluttonous pig, move more, you lazy slob, with something like nourishing food, nourishing movement, nourishing life. I hope that feels better. And this is something you can say to yourself if you sort of have a, a conditioned harsh critic um, that might say things like eat less, move more. You can practice replacing it with today I want to nourish myself with food, nourish myself with movement and live an overall nourishing life. Um, we're bumping up against some time constraints, so I'm going to do this part quickly, but nourishing life means getting plenty of sleep, getting plenty of rest, um, and then these sort of two big buckets, it means being approaching, um, trying to cultivate as much fulfillment as possible in our work life, um, and trying to create as much fulfillment as possible in our relationships. And that's not just a nice soft extra, we know that uh, for every measure of well-being, as well as for weight loss and weight maintenance, that a big factor is stress. And a really straightforward way to look at stress is that we experience stress anytime we have an unmet need. And we have needs for sleep, we have needs for rest. Um, in work, we have needs for um, money. We have needs for something like meaning or purpose. We have needs to... Um, for enjoyment and play and contribution. Um, 
And in relationships, we have need for connection and safety and security and bonding and, and all these kind of things. And the absence of those is experienced as stress. And um, I'm going to have to spare you the physiological explanation, but uh, the, the more detail. In short, when we're in a stressed state, our bodies preferentially uh, burn carbohydrate and store fat. When we're in a relaxed state, we preferentially burn fat and, and, uh, and store carbohydrate um, in our liver and our muscles. Um, so chronic stress, chronic unmet needs lead to chronic stress, lead to the chronic storage of excessive fat on our bodies. Um, so really, if you're looking at a, a non-simplistic view of metabolism, yes, you need to nourish yourself with food. Yes, you need to nourish yourself with movement. It's also essential um, to proactively meet the other um, needs in your life. And this is where holistic becomes, uh, wellness becomes a really holistic uh, concept. I'll add that you don't have to you know, change your life in a, in, in a week or two weeks or three weeks or three months. And I'll share that the way my processes go with clients often are that what they really want to work on initially is eating better or exercising more. And that's what we'll initially be working on. But what's very neat is you might be familiar with this. Uh, there's a saying, how you do one thing is how you do anything. Or some people say how you do one thing is how you do everything. When you start approaching yourself from this perspective of caring for yourself more and um, nourishing yourself and proactively meeting your needs in one area, you're learning how to meet it in that area. But you're also beating, you're um, developing this muscle, so to speak, of, of meeting your needs. So it's very common that I'm three, four months into working with a client and their eating habits are getting a lot better, their exercise habits are getting a lot better, and maybe we haven't worked on much outside of that. And I'll ask an open-ended question, you know, is there anything else you want to be working on in this next couple of weeks? And there, you know, the answers vary as much as the people I work with, but examples would be things like, you know, I really haven't enjoyed my work in quite a while or I've really been quite stressed at work for quite a while. Um, or, you know, I think it's time I, I really get out there and start dating again. Or I've been, you know, haven't talked to my sister in a year and that it's, it's stressing me out. It doesn't feel right. I need to bridge that. What's happening is um, two things. The person is getting used to proactively meeting their needs and the areas in their life in which they're not proactively meeting their needs are starting to stand out. Number two, they're starting to feel better because they're starting to get happier and healthier by proactively meeting, you know, eating better, exercising more, maybe sleeping more, um, getting more rest. And when we feel better, um, the things in our lives that don't feel good, they stand out. So um, I offer that as a framework. Um, Offer that as a framework for looking at um, your well-being and your self-care, not from that eat less, move more, which sometimes is interpreted as like calories in, calories out um, approach that doesn't feel so good. And try on, you know, I invite you to try on this idea of, of nourishing yourself holistically. I'm going to add a quick um, story about a study. Um, to tie this together um, and present the idea that this isn't just a soft, um, soft idea. So they take couples, married couples, bring them into a hospital and give each person a, uh, a burn wound on their, fur on their forearm through friction. Uh, then what they do is they take each couple, they put them in a room and ask them to do a problem solving game challenge and they're being they don't know they're being observed but they're being observed through um, one-way glass so they can't see that they're being observed but the researchers can observe them and the subjects get ratings the couples get ratings for essentially the quality of their relationship 
they're given ratings for whether they talk to each other um, in positive ways or negative ways, whether there's supportive touch, um, whether there's any contention in how they work on things together, whether one person tries to solve it by him or herself or is more collaborative, and they get a quality of um, relationship rating. And then they measure how well everyone's burn wound heals for the next uh, something like six to 12 weeks. And they also take blood. And what they found is that the people in the relationships that were rated of higher quality, their burns heal faster. Uh, they have less pain complaints. Um, they use less topical medication for the burn. Uh, and then the internal markers, they have less inflammation. Uh, that's a good way to summarize it. Less markers of inflammation, um, better markers of immunity and, and sort of a healing response. Um, so these things like um, fulfillment in work, um, fulfillment in relationships, uh, other things that I haven't gotten into today that fit into this nourishing life category, like spending time in nature, um, a spiritual practice that works for you, all of these things scientifically are shown to improve our well-being physiologically, reduce our total amount of stress, and this um, this serves to both improve well-being and help us with weight loss. All right, we only have just over 10 minutes left, so I'm going to skip a section and I'm going to cover it. I'll cover it tomorrow or later this week when I follow up. The section has to do more with uh, what I call compensatory eating. A lot of people call emotional eating. Um, I'm going to share, uh, it builds off of where we are right now, and I apologize that we're running out of time. Um, I'm going to share with you a framework of how to work with emotional eating um, using a holistic approach to well being. So I'll share that by email. So before I take questions in a couple minutes, you know, what can you expect um, as you explore this approach of, of anti-dieting? Um, one way I, to answer that question is to offer a, a case study. And I'm thinking of a gentleman that I coached about two years ago for about six months. And he came to me with, um, he had just been diagnosed, he's about, he's about 50 years old, had just been diagnosed diabetic based on his blood sugar. Um, he had been pre-diabetic for four or five years leading up to that. So we, he had what is common, uh, a slow gradual weight gain over a number of years, along with a slow gradual increase in his blood sugar levels. And he was ready to do something about this. Um, he used an approach like we're talking about. Um, I would say he, he was pretty low on the, the index of junk food to processed food. He was probably eating, uh, excuse me, of junk food to real food. He was probably eating 20, uh, only about 25% real food and more like 75% processed food. And, you know, I'm estimating it, but we flipped, we pretty much flipped that. Um, he developed the habit of something like 75% real food, 25% processed food. And he went from being, uh, a, you know, not, uh, not exercising to doing kickboxing classes twice a week. That's what we discovered was um, his happy place exercise. So two, two classes a week, something like 60 to 75 minutes. And, you know, so he didn't do the biggest loser, right? He didn't go on a really rigid diet. He didn't uh, exercise two hours of doing, you know, two, three, four hours of miserable exercise a day. He lost about 26 pounds in six months, um, which is not a, not a huge rate. It's just a hair over a pound a week. Um, he reversed his uh, blood sugar levels from diabetic all the way through the pre-diabetic range to the very top of the normal range by the time we were done working together. So his physician was thrilled, um, was able to take him off um, uh, the, the low level diabetes medication he was already on, on the contingency that he could keep it there. Then six months later, without, you know, so he stopped working with me. This is the way I work with people. So diets and these other approaches, they require like constant vigilance. But when you learn to eat well and to exercise well and truly make it a part of your lifestyle, 
um, you don't have that recidivism. You don't you don't bounce back. So in his subsequent six months, his his weight loss slowed. Um, he was coming up again. He didn't have much more to lose. He lost about 10 pounds in the subsequent six months, and he got his A1C down. That's uh, his blood sugar test. Um, you know, another good notch. So he was just a little bit more securely in the um, in the normal healthy range. Um, so the way I like to look at this is it's not, um, if you're looking for the dramatic before and after photos of the biggest loser, you know, someone losing 125 pounds in six months, that doesn't happen with this more um, realistic approach. Um, but what happens is it both the well-being and the weight loss and the self-care habits are sustained. Um, tying this together, there's a, there's a great quote um, that I'd love to leave you with. Um, this gentleman, he's a philosopher, Charles Eisenstein. He says, true discipline is simply self-remembering. No forcing or fighting is required. Now, isn't that kind of cool, right? We think of discipline as I've got to discipline myself. You might have an image of, you know, as awful as it sounds, like cracking the whip, right? We, you know, we use those kind of words and those kind of phrases in our language when we talk about discipline. Um, but what Eisenstein presents is that discipline is sort of coming home to yourself. And, and I hope that that idea of coming home to yourself and the way I presented eating in harmony with your hunger and the foods that leave you feeling good and doing movement that you truly enjoy and holistically meeting your needs feels more like coming home to yourself. Um, I'll give you a litmus test. Um, to me, a person who's really embracing true discipline um, is feeling something more like self-advocacy um, than self-punishment. It feels more like they're advocating for themselves than punishing themselves. Um, the last thought before I take questions is get support. We're a, we're a stubbornly independent, proudly self-reliant culture. And we think, if I can't do this myself, if I can't do this myself, there's something wrong with me. Um, I recommend getting as much support as you can. I re recommend getting personal support and whatever kind of professional support would be most helpful to you. Um, don't feel like you need to do it alone. Um, reach out for help. No one does anything real substantial. Change by themselves. Change is difficult. Change is a lot more helpful when you get the kind of support that's helpful to you. So um, thank you for bearing with me. I did go longer than I expected from a speaking perspective. I will take questions for as you know, a, a solid 15 or 20 minutes if there are that many questions. Um, if anyone needs to go because we've bumped, you know, we're about to bump up against the 90 minutes we promised, um, remember that we'll be sending out a recording. Um, so you'll be able to listen to the Q&A section if you'd like. And I'm, I'm um, totally available to answer your personal questions as well. So um, Kim, I'll hand it over to you and see if you have a, a juicy question or two to start with. So we do have one person that asked about the water consumption and she's wondering if coffee counts towards that goal. And I also, I know that we get a lot of people in the store that, you know, they're trying to instill healthy habits and they've just they've said that they just absolutely hate water they know yeah. how important it is and how do you encourage you know, additional water consumption when people can't stand drinking water sure um so the second question do something to make it make it a little bit more appealing and this is where as a nutritionist i you know put away my perfectionism right so from a pure physiological perspective humans and all animals have a need for pure for plain water um, but um, anything that gets you in that direction is 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 really helpful so things like seltzer water flavored seltzer water um, 
seltzer water with lemon and lime, regular water with lemon and lime, um, even a more um, processed beverage, but look for things that um, don't have sugar, but also don't have uh, artificial sweeteners. Um, uh, probably the best thing out there at this point is uh, sweetened by stevia, um, which is an herb. Um, so that would be my suggestion. And, and my, um, uh, to give you an idea what you can expect, most people reacquire uh, that taste for water over time um, once they get going. I wouldn't count coffee, um, but I wouldn't discourage a person from having coffee. Uh, but I'll also say the same thing. When, um, or a similar thing, once you start to get more hydrated and once you start to improve your overall well being, um, that's the best way um, to reduce coffee consumption um, eventually if that's something a person wants to do. Because um, being straightforward, coffee consumption mostly relates to fatigue. Um, and fatigue mostly relates to overall well-being. Um, so I would say, you know, uh, in the spirit of not trying to change everything at once, keep drinking coffee, but try to get the, the water consumption in as well. This question probably isn't there uh, in the chat room, but it might get asked, um, am I going to urinate more? Am I going to be going to the bathroom all the time? And you, you will to some degree. That's something, um, but not um, as often as, you know, it's not like it's going to interrupt your life. Um, but if you're not, if a person isn't drinking water at all, you, they will be going to the bathroom more. It's, it's natural and healthy um, to be doing so. Hey, Jason, and as a follow up to that, I'm wondering if someone is drinking seltzer in, instead of water, do you have to drink more of the seltzer or is it kind of a one to one conversion? No, you really get in the same water. Um, you're really getting the same amount of water. The only um, the only potential problem in there is does the carbonation uh, negatively affect the digestive process in some way, and that that is important. Um, but I'll I'll take someone drinking enough seltzer water versus being chronically dehydrated and not drinking anything. Um, but over time. Uh, cultivating a really healthy digestive system is really important because um, if anything is off in our digestion, even if we're eating the highest quality foods, uh, we don't extract the nutrients from them properly, which I didn't mention earlier is also why I recommend drinking water first thing in the morning. And then I mentioned before lunch or before dinner, another way of looking at this is between uh, breakfast and lunch and between lunch and dinner, I don't generally recommend if you're really trying to do this as sharp as possible, drinking a lot of water with our meals. Because when we drink water with meals, we dilute uh, the, the acid that exists in our stomach whose job is to help break down and digest our food. So really what you want to do is drink water away from food and when you have food, eat slowly, chew your food thoroughly, let your digestive system uh, work undiluted uh, to digest the food. That sounds great. There was another person that uh, had questioned how you stop yourself from eating when you're, a lot of times you eat until you're too full and you haven't stopped yourself until it's too late, you're already too full. She, you did answer that to a certain extent. But I'm wondering if, do you encourage people to participate in mindful eating or anything like that, that you really got to check in with yourself or any other tips? Yeah, that's, a, that's an awesome question that is a great thing to delve into further. Um, something in the direction of um, mindful eating, really self-aware eating, um, broadly can mean, um, uh, having less distractions, less television, uh, internet news, right? So that what you're what you're doing is eating. Um, when what we're doing is eating, uh, the, we'll get the cues faster uh, that we'll, that we're, that we're full. Um, another thing that tends to help a lot of people whenever possible um, is eating with other people. Versus the extreme example of that would be like 
um, eating in your car by yourself kind of thing. So eating in a stress situation by yourself um, tends to lead to um, eating quickly. Um, it's kind of about just getting it in. Whereas when we're eating with other people, and then when, when we're eating quickly and just getting it in, um, the, the time isn't there for our body to signal, hey, I'm starting to get full. Whereas when we eat with other people, we tend to have a few bites, have some conversation, have a few bites, have some conversation. Um, that's really helpful. Um, and then my final answer I'll, to the person who asked is, this delves a little bit into the compensatory eating, emotional eating realm, and I'll, I'll answer that thoroughly in my email. That sounds great. We are out of questions. Cool. Cool. Well, I want to thank everyone for coming. And I want to thank uh, Kim for hosting Kim and Coastal Pharmacy and Wellness. As I mentioned a little bit in my introduction, they have an ongoing seminar series, doctors, nurse practitioners, physical therapists, wellness coaches, all kinds of holistic wellness practitioners. Um, and they're trans, uh, transferring their program to online for, for the time being with the pandemic. So stay tuned to their schedule. Um, and as I've mentioned a few times, I'm going to send a follow up um, with uh, some more details about today. And I welcome additional questions. And thanks again for coming.